You know, tonight as we come to the book of Colossians once again, we'll begin with verse 15. One of the things that uh, I think makes um, any book in the Bible uh, more interesting to us is to understand why did the Holy Spirit lead the Apostle Paul to write this book. And the book of Colossians was written to the church at Colossae that was embroiled in a time of heretics that were in the land. It was a time that people were infiltrating churches and, and of course, people had come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And, and along with that, Satan hates when people come to a saving knowledge of Christ. And so the way Satan combats the church is through trying to bring in those with damnable doctrines, those with teachings that are not truth to biblical teaching. And so when the pastor of the church at Colossae went to a Roman prison to talk with the Apostle Paul about some things he brought up, about some of the problems that were known in the church and that has come to be known as the Colossian heresy or the heresies that, that were at large during that time. Basically, there were people in the city of Colossae that were teaching that God is good, but that all matter is evil. God is good, some were saying, but all matter is evil. And this was a part of that heresy group known as the Gnostics. It was a group in the early church. And these false teachers said that since all matter is evil, Jesus Christ could not have had a human body. And according to their theory, if Jesus truly possessed a real body, then they said he would have been evil too. So as part of this false teaching, they, not, they denied the incarnation of Jesus Christ. The incarnation speaking about God becoming flesh in this world. And they denied the fact that God was born into the world in the person of Jesus Christ. Christ of Nazareth. They believed that Jesus was just merely a spirit being who only appeared to be real. And so to this group called the Gnostics, Jesus was not the creator according to them. He was not God in human flesh. Can you see why that was a problem? Can you see why Epaphras went down to the Roman prison to talk to Paul and to share with him what was taking place in the city. And so in the minds of this group of heretics, Jesus was not enough for salvation, according to them. This group that were Gnostics also believed that deeper spiritual knowledge was the path to salvation. And there were just certain ones that were blessed with that knowledge. And so they believed that they actually could become gods themselves by obtaining this greater spiritual knowledge and by separating from the physical world which they viewed as evil and this is a great oversimplification that I've given you tonight as to what the Gnostics were teaching there in the city of Colossae but this tiny scant view of information just gives you a glimpse of the false teaching that revealed that some members of the church were leaving the path of or orthodoxy and they were now walking in the way of this heresy. So one of the members of the Colossian church, the leader, uh, Epirus, he brought this alarming news to Paul. Paul was in prison there in Rome. And so Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wrote back to this church this letter in order to correct 
this error in doctrine that some were falling prey to. Above all, Paul wanted to correct their false teaching concerning the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 15, we see Christ's relationship to the Father. And so this is why he turns to verse 15. He says, he, speaking of God, or speaking here of Jesus, he is the image and the in of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And that's why he is in chapters 1 and chapters 2 of the book of Colossians. He's teaching the doctrinal issues of the deity of Christ. And that Christ is the head of the church. Now these early heresies that had infiltrated the church, such as Gnosticism and Arianism, these were early heresies. In fact, in Arianism, which was from Arius of Alexander, he said that Jesus was a creature. He said Jesus was a created being. But in 325 AD, the church fathers got together and at the council of Nicaea, let me tell you, they nailed a nail in that coffin and they said that Jesus the Son, the Son is very man, a very man and very God, a very God. Later on in church history, Socinus, another one, propagated the heresy that Jesus was not God and mankind did not need a savior from sin. So you can understand why Paul is trying to very explicitly, very assertively, very definitively, he is correcting these would-be people out there that were trying to distort the gospel uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 15, we see some marks of the identification of Christ that would make him superior to anyone else who has ever lived or walked the face of the earth. Notice in verse 15, he is Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He's the image of him. We are made in his image. And Jesus is the invisible. Uh, he's made in the image of the invisible God. Remember, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Notice in verse 15, he says, the firstborn over all creation. That word firstborn. This is his relationship to the Father. And his position in the Trinity. God is the everlasting Father. The Son is the everlasting Son. His position is the Trinity, in the Trinity is that of the Son, Jesus, the Son of God. That word firstborn, it indicates his priority before all creation. Nowhere does Scripture teach that Jesus Christ had his beginnings in Bethlehem. Let me tell you, we are told in the great prophecy in the book of Micah, chapter 5 and verse 2, that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, but that he came from everlasting. In fact, Isaiah chapter 9 tells us, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The child is born. The son is given. Jesus came out of eternity and he took upon himself 
our humanity. And so Paul is dealing with one of these philosophies of the day, of those mystery religions. It's called the Demurge. And it held that God created a creature beneath him, and then that creature created a creature beneath him, and you just keep on going down the ladder, that heretical, uh, heretical teaching would say until finally you come to a creature that created this universe. Can you only imagine how these early Christians some of them were falling prey to this kind of thing. And this created, 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 created are emanations, they said, from God. And so Gnosticism taught that Jesus was one of these created creatures that emanated from God. Now Paul is going to answer that in this section he says that Jesus Christ is the firstborn of all creation. He's back of all creation. The Greek word is prototokos, meaning before all creation. He was not born in creation. He is the one who came down over 2,000 years ago and became flesh and dwelt among us. He existed before any creation. In the beginning, John said, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John said, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Notice in that next verse, in verse 16, for by him, all things, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. Think about those things in heaven. The saints of God, the angelic beings that surround the throne of God, those angelic servants. Notice, for by him... All things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And so Paul is expressly nailing down the importance of who Jesus is, that Jesus was very man of very man and very God of very God. In the book of John, we see God the Father is the everlasting Father and God the Son is the everlasting Son. You know, it's really hard. I hear people oftentimes say, you know, I just don't understand the Trinity. They said, you know, it appears that there's more than one. And to me, it seems very simple to understand that God is one. He operated in three fashions. Just as some of you out there are operating several fashions. Some of you women are someone's daughter. Some of you are someone's sister. Some of you are someone's mother. Some of you are someone's grandmother. Some of you are someone's great-grandmother. But you're one person. You cannot divide you. But you operate in three different ways or, or in various ways. As a daughter, as a mother, as a spouse, as a grandmother, as a great-grandmother. And so you're still one person. God is one. God created this world. Over in the book of Genesis, it says, let us, plural, us. Who is the us? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There is no beginning. There is no end. Yes, we see a baby born in Bethlehem, a child is born, but the Son, God, stepping out of heaven, the Son is given. 
And God operates in these three roles in the Trinity. He's one God, but he operates three different ways. He stepped out of heaven to come to Calvary to bring redemption through us. It's through the Son of the living God, God himself. That oftentimes seems like such a spiritually complex definition of who God is. But I think that it makes all the sense in the world when you put it down to comparing yourself or you're a father out there, you're somebody's son, you're someone's husband, you're someone's father, you're someone's brother, you're someone's grandfather, someone's great-grandfather, but you're still only one guy. But you operate in all three of those distinct ways. And God is one God. And he operates in three ways. When Jesus, God, went back to heaven, where he sits at the right hand of the Father, he said, wait until the promise comes. He told those disciples, wait in Jerusalem till the promise comes. And the promise was the Holy Spirit, God in us, God that lives in our hearts. And so, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they have always been, and they always will be. There are several places in Scripture where the Lord Jesus is called the firstborn. He's called the firstborn of all creation. He's called the firstborn from the dead. And he's also called the only begotten. When Jesus Christ is called the firstborn of all creation, it's not referring to his birth in Bethlehem. It means that he has top priority of position. It has nothing to do with his origin at all. Notice what the psalmist said in the 89th Psalm, verse 27. I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. This makes it very clear that Christ, as the eternal son, he holds the position of top priority to all creation. In other words, he is the creator. There is no demurge or this false teaching where they were saying God created this creature and this creature created this creature and then you just go on down for a long ways through all of these emanations and then suddenly you created one that did all the creation. I mean, can you only imagine the rank stupidity behind that kind of thought and yet people fell for it. People will fall for anything if they don't stand for something that's true. Amen? And so we see that in other words, no series of creatures being cremated or created one after another. He himself created, notice, all things. Some other verses that speak of the person of Christ are found in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, who being the brightness, Hebrews says, Notice of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Aren't you grateful for that tonight? That doesn't sound very much like a mere creature, does it? He's the second person of the Godhead and of the angels, he said, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. The Lord Jesus is not one of these creatures. But Hebrews 1, 7 and 8 says, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. What we are talking about here is not that the Lord Jesus was born a creature. 
we are talking about the fact that the Lord Jesus is God in human flesh. And when he came into the world, a child was born, but the son was given and he came out of eternity past. The angel's announcement to Mary was that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God, Luke 135. Why? Because that is who he is. He was the Son of God before he came into this world. Thou art the Christ. Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, Matthew 16, 16. And so you can understand the gravity and the weight of this letter to the Colossian Christians. Paul was concerned. Paul immediately was moved by the Holy Spirit. And these prison letters that you and I have been looking at, Philippians, Ephesians, Philippians and Colossians, and we'll go to Philemon after this, it was vitally important that Paul let them understand some of these doctrinal teachings that they desperately needed in their lives to take hold of so that they would not become prey and victim to those cultic mystery religions that were out there in the world. Now, to bring that down to where you and I are tonight, let me tell you, there's a lot of people that would love to, that, that love to speak about a Jesus that is contrary to the Jesus in this Bible. And Paul spoke about that as he wrote to the various churches. And folks, let me tell you tonight, I don't know about you, but in my heart there rings a melody, as the song says. The melody in my heart that rings is the Holy Spirit of the living God. That when I hear something that just does not tweak with Scripture, I immediately know that that's a falsehood. And the Holy Spirit leads us in all truth. And let me tell you, this word is truth. We're struggling in a world today where everybody is seeking truth. And oftentimes we don't know what the truth of anything is in the media. It's subject to who, who's ever interpretation. But I want you to know you can take it to the bank tomorrow that this is God's word. Heaven and earth will someday pass away, but he said his word is established forever. And if you want to know truth, and if you want to be able to dispel the mystery religions and the cults of this world, get into the truth and let the truth get into you so that when confronted, the Holy Spirit of the living God will move in your heart and you will know that that is not true. Oftentimes I hear people in many conversations that I have that people will say something and I think, you know, that just is not true according to the scripture. Or they'll say the Bible says, you know, this is from the Bible and, you know, it's a quote you've heard all your life, but it's not a biblical quote. You know, and I, I get so amused when I hear that because I think, you know, here's the, here's the spiritual ineptness of people in the world today. And as our world is changing and as our young people are thrust out into a world of materialism, humanism, liberalism, Liberalism is running rampant in universities all across the land. And unless we are schooled by the Holy Spirit through the word of truth, we will be subjected to all kinds of things that are thrown our way. I'm thankful tonight for God 
the invisible God who created and spoke into existence. I'm grateful that he looked down upon a sinful world and realized that through his holiness, he could not look at sin. So he, in incarnation, that means the word God put on human flesh. The spirit put on human flesh came to the world to identify with you and me. Yes, a child was born, but it was the son that was given from eternity past. And I'm grateful to know tonight that he loved the world so much that he gave. He gave his all so that you and I might have redemption and reconciliation and justification. We are justified as if we had never sinned. And I stand on the blood of Jesus that cleanses me from all sin. Aren't you grateful? Aren't you thankful tonight for the son who came to bring redemption? Aren't you grateful when Jesus ascended back to heaven to be at the right hand there in the second person of the Trinity where he ever liveth to make intercession for us? Aren't you thankful that he said, I will not leave you comfortless. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, which is the third person that God operates in. He lives, he lives Christ Jesus lives today. We sing, Holy Spirit, breathe on me. Aren't you grateful for the Holy Spirit that came to indwell us, God in us? We speak about a God so far away, but yet he lives within the human heart of every person who reaches out through faith and receives his wonderful gift of grace. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for your wonderful attentiveness. Thank you for being here tonight. Blessings on you and your family. Traveling graces for people that will be going to and from places. Please pray for the safety of people. Please continue to pray that, that we will soon have a vaccine that will wipe out this terrible plague that is um, touching so many people's lives. I heard one say that it should be by summer that we get back to quote unquote normal. So tie not, hang on, keep the faith. Amen. God bless you. Be sure and remember no Wednesday night service this week. Um, Thank you once again for your wonderful love, devotion, and for your presence here tonight. God bless you. You are dismissed.